Hi, my name is Brad and I'm the pastor at Community Fellowship. Thank you so much for tuning in to this online gathering. What you're going to see today is people worshiping God with great music and listening to teaching from the Bible that will help them live their lives. And we're excited about the fact that you're joining with us in that. If you have any questions, please ask them. If you have statements to make, make comments. And if you think this could help people around you, share this video so that others may join us. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I'll come back and see you again in the middle and the end of the video. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow tries to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Come on, sing it! My fear doesn't stand a chance Community Fellowship, we're so happy that you are a part of us today. We're just here to worship God and learn about Him, all right? Amen. All right. Let's keep singing.
be seated for just a second if you'd like. In just a moment, we're going to do something that Christians have been doing for a couple of thousand years, and that is the, the worshipful moment of remembrance through the Last Supper or communion. The idea is that Jesus presented this meal as uh, kind of an extended version of something that Jewish people had done for thousands of years as they remembered that God passed over them in Egypt and moved them out of slavery. It was called the Passover meal. When Jesus is sharing that meal with his disciples, he did something very differently. He, t he said to them that the bread in the meal was representative of his body, and the cup, the wine, in the meal was representative of his blood. And for them, it was an extremely difficult thing to understand or to think through. It almost seemed blasphemous to at least one of them that he could be suggesting this. He tried to tell them that in the next few moments he would be arrested, he would be tried, he would be convicted, and ultimately he would die as the sacrifice for humanity's sins, the gift of grace from God the Father given to us on behalf of us. And they just didn't yet get it. But that night, he told them that there would be a time in the future when they would need to remember. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And then we see in the early church, in the book of Corinthians and others, where they did this. They came together and they, they referred to it as breaking bread. They came to and they, bro they broke bread together and they remembered what Jesus had done. Now, the reason we're doing this today is as we look at the idea of worship and what it means to be worshipful, one of the things that we want to make sure and deal with is the idea of remembering as an act of worship. I'm someone that needs this. I need, I need to be reminded of this because I'm someone who loses everything. Like, I'm the guy who every three days can't find his car keys, gets to work without his wallet, left it on the different table than I normally leave it at, and so my my, you know, my normal routine in which I didn't grab it for whatever reason. See, for me, forgetting is easy. Remembering takes effort. But we're told as believers over and over and over to remember. In the Old Testament, it's why they built altars. When God did something great, they built an altar there to remember what had happened in that place. The Scripture describes this as a type of building an altar in our own heart and in our own memory where when we take this food, this, this bread, and this cup together, we remember what Jesus has done. Now, a very important thing about worship is that we remember. You see, you're going to find yourself in a place where you need to remember what Jesus had done. It might be a day or two after the worst mistake you've ever made. And as you soak in the guilt of your sin and the shame of your choice, you need to be reminded that what Jesus has done is sufficient for you. It might be when you feel like all hope is lost and you're unsure what to do next, and you need to be reminded of what Jesus has done. It might be when someone has offended or hurt you, and you're tempted to stand in judgment over them and to hold on to bitterness or hold on to hate, that you need to be reminded that you're not a Christ follower because you're a great person. You're a Christ follower because you're a redeemed person. And you need to be a part of helping be redemptive in that person who hurt you, who offended you in their life. It's why we've been forgiven, but we've been forgiven to forgive. Another act of remembering is reminding. And that is that, that I might not remember, but you have the opportunity to remind me. That's what good spiritual counseling is most of the time, is simply reminding people of things they already know, helping each of us remember what Jesus has done. So as we sing this next song, we're going to stand together. We're going to form two lines. You guys have done this with us before, and, and everybody on this side will come down here, and everybody on this side will come down here, and, and you just simply walk up to the table. You can do it alone. You could do it with your spouse, with your friend, with your child, uh, with, a, with, a, with a buddy that you've met today. And, and you just simply take a moment. We're not rushing. We're not in a hurry. We have plenty of time. So you take that moment and you remember. As you stand right here at the altar, you eat 
the cracker and, and swallow it. Drink the cup. With each time thanking God for what he's already done, being reminded of what he's doing, and seeking God for what he's going to do in your life. Something we do here as a church is if you have a relationship with the person in front of you, I do not recommend this uh, with a stranger, but if you know the person in front of you, you might, you might put your hand on their shoulder and just pray for them while they take communion. You might expect the person behind you to do the same. Uh, if you know them, if you have a relationship with them. This morning, I saw a young lady who was here by herself. I barely know her, but as she walked up to the communion table alone, I walked up to her and said, do you mind if I take communion with you? And through tears, she said, thank you. And we got to share a moment just taking communion together. Uh, This is something we don't do alone. This is something we do together. And so as a church together, let's remember what Jesus has done. Would Would you stand with us? And as the team leads us in worship, I invite you to come. Lord, take these elements and bring blessing in our life. This bread, this cup, may it be done in remembrance of you. In your name we pray. Amen. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me, and love has called my name, and I've been born.
of God.
the mention of your name I've come to worship I've come to worship And I'm no longer a slave to fear Just sing this with me I am a child of God And I'm no longer God. Amen. You can be seated. Thanks, you all. So we have an exciting day today. It's already been one, and I want to thank you for being here. I've seen a few new faces, so if I haven't gotten to personally meet you, I look forward to doing that. I know you've had an opportunity to meet some others. Thank you for being here today. Today is a bit of a unique day for us because one of the things that we're doing is we are introducing the crowd uh, to Seth and Jenna Stennett, uh, who uh, I and our leadership team uh, believe uh, God is calling here to be our children's director, children's pastor and uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this couple, and then I'm going to ask Seth to come and, and share his story and their story with you guys. Um, I, I'm just getting to know Seth, uh, but I have known Jenna since she was probably 10 years old. Her family attended the church that I pastored in Paducah for 13 years, and uh, I know her mom and dad, her brothers, and uh, and just I just love this young lady. She she's she's so uh, so. I joked around the first gathering and said, I know I'm going to like Seth because of who he married. You know, just did well. You know, and so. Um, I, I, interesting fact is when, when uh, Jenna was young, uh, Stephanie and I owned two big male dogs at the same time. Bad idea. Two big all-male dogs at the same time. And one of them uh, was Tramp, who was kind of like our son before we had a son, you know. And then um, and the other was, uh, was Tank. And Tank was uh, a champion chocolate lab who had won lots and lots of stuff, and a friend of mine owned him, and he gave him to me when my friend moved to Seattle to a place where he could not have a dog. And so we brought Tank, This he was, he was a, I think, a son or a grandson of Hooper in Paducah, the Paducah, the big chocolate lab. And so we had Tank and we had Tramp, and they hated each other. And so uh, the third or fourth time, Brad had to get between 220-pound male dogs who didn't like each other. We decided that Tank was going to find a new home. Okay, and so he was a fantastic dog. It just didn't fit in our family. And Jenna's younger brother uh, apparently was looking for a dog at the time. And so I found out that and gave. I, don't you love it when somebody gives your kid a dog? You, they didn't ask you, really. They just gave your kid a dog. So I, I took Tramp over to their family, and uh, for the first hour or so, I'm Tank. I'm sorry. Uh, he threw a bone or something in the backyard. The dog retrieved it every time, brought it back to him. He could duck hunt with him and all that kind of stuff. And so it was a really cool thing. So I then became the guy who could go and feed Tank when they were on vacation. That was my next role. And little by little, we got to know each other. I share all that to say. Um, when I found out several months ago that there was a possibility that, that this young couple might be, um, might be able to eventually end up here, I just personally felt very excited about that. But in order to make sure that we handled ourselves well and that we, we, we do leadership with all integrity, what we did was the way we, we found our new children's director is our, our, our leadership team meets and discusses the need. We look at job description and everything else. And then we bring up out of that leadership team kind of a sub team, like a smaller group who can do interviews and look at resumes and, and, and really find all that was out there. We had several people apply for the job. I don't remember how six or seven, maybe eight people that applied for the job. Uh, that team narrowed that down to four names pretty quickly and then narrowed it down to three names. And then after uh, interviewing and talking to people on multiple occasions, uh, they, they rated as individuals. They rated who they felt you know, was the, the, the right person for the job. And after I had a chance to look at their rating system, what I found was every member of the team rated one, two, and three in the exact same order. In the exact same order. And in each case, uh, their recommendation was that Seth was the choice, was the person we needed to talk to. And so since that time, we've had an opportunity to introduce most of our leadership team to them personally, and there have been a lot of social opportunities to connect. And uh, Seth, if you don't mind, man, I'd love for you to come and just tell us your story, brother. 
Hey, good morning, guys. I was sitting here watching Brad, and I don't know how he does it, but he stands like halfway off the stage while he's talking, and I was just kind of curious. He must really trust the Lord to, to do that. So, um, so uh, this morning I'm going to kind of share my testimony with you guys. Um, it, it, it's mostly for you guys to get to know me and kind of see where I came from and where the Lord's brought me and all the way up to standing here before you guys. But also, too, um, I was a guy that sat in church for many years and didn't really have a relationship for Jesus. So if that's you, I want this to speak to you. I want you to know that you can sit in church every day for years and, and not love Jesus and not have a relationship with him. So I'll start off with uh, I had wonderful parents. Um, I was in church basically my whole life. Um, my mom was a Christian for my whole life, as far as I can remember, and my dad came to faith. It had to be after I was six years old. I was so young, I don't really know the exact time. Um, but I think the Lord used my mom and staying with him because he was a kind of a rough guy at first and used all that to, to draw him to Jesus. And she stayed with him and got him in church and, and was very faithful to my father and the Lord. Um, but anyway, uh, so we were in church. Uh, we started off at a little church in Diamond, and I was there for years. My father was best friends with a pastor. They were fishing buddies. They went fishing all the time. And... Um, a couple things, a couple things happened. Um, he ended up not being the pastor, but at that time, um, I had got saved. I went down. There was an altar call one day, and I went down and supposedly got saved. I don't even remember it. My mom had to tell me when I was like 10, 11, you know, because I didn't even remember that it had ever happened. And uh, so anyway, so supposedly I was saved then, and so my whole life we we went to that church. And after all that stuff happened, we ended up going to First Baptist in Clay, and that's where my parents still are today. And uh, I was in the youth, um, was heavily involved, and did all that stuff. And probably till I was about a sophomore, sophomore, junior, kind of in that era, um, that's when all my friends started to get their license, and they could all drive and go do. So then I was, since I lived in the country, the only thing I did was ride four-wheelers and go hunting and stuff like that. But then all my friends could drive. A whole new world was opened up to me. And so um, that's when we started drinking and partying on the weekends and doing all that. And I basically did that all the way up until salvation and um, it was very apparent that I didn't have a relationship with Jesus in my life, that that was just something that, that I just went down and did, the motions, it just, I just did it. But I never really had a relationship with Jesus. Um, I do think that Jesus was working in my life then. I think my whole life, from my parents to, to the Diamond Church, to the church at Clay, the, the youth leaders and the people we put in my life, those were just seeds that were being planted. Um, but then... Uh, it basically came came to a point to, um, I was living with my girlfriend at the time, I had a job, and I was still going out drinking and doing all this stuff on the weekends, and, and every, if I wasn't at work, I was doing something I shouldn't be doing probably. And uh, basically, God took everything away from me. He took my job, he took my girlfriend, he took all my friends, everything that was going on, he basically just crashed everything in my life, and he was drawing me to him. So everything that I thought was good in my life was completely horrible, whether it was friends or girlfriends or whatever I was doing was, wasn't good, and the Lord took everything away from me. So I was super depressed. I had to move back in with mom and dad again. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a little time in between, and um, I remember I was at my, my, one of my best friends is Wade Williams, and he is two years older than me. He's a farmer back home. Um, but he was the Sunday school teacher at our church. And I didn't know he was a Sunday school teacher. And one day we're all grilling out and drinking and having a good time. And I see him over. He lived next door to my buddy's house. And I was trying to get him to come over and drink with us just because I knew him. And I didn't know he was a Sunday school teacher at the time. But he's like, no, nah, man, it's all right. He's like, but you know what? You ought to come check out um, check out church. Come come to my Sunday school class and check it out. And I was like, ah, whatever, Wade, you know. That was the church I grew up in. Everybody knew my whole life. They knew all the mistakes I made. They had seen me and heard me, and so I was, you know, I was ashamed to even step foot back in the church. Um, long story short, he kept working on me, and the Lord kept working on me, and eventually one day I was just so broken that I decided to go back to church. And uh, I just remember the message out of Luke, and the words were very clear, depart from me, I never knew you. And so I, right then, through the sermon and the message, those words, I just, I realized that I had never had a relationship with Jesus. And so right then, that's when my relationship with Jesus started. Um, and uh, so I started uh, serving in the church. I, I worked the soundboard. I did um, started serving with the fifth graders, just doing whatever they needed. We had a small church, so anything they asked, I was there all, all the time. Um, it was funny because 
the only friend that I had that was kind of my age was Wade, and he had three kids already, and he owned a bunch of farmland, so there wasn't like he had a lot of time to spend with me, but one thing that we did to keep me accountable was I worked Monday through Friday, so I wasn't doing anything I wasn't supposed to do Monday through Friday when I was first saved, but Saturday mornings he would meet me with me at 5 o'clock because if I'd went out, you know, the, or Saturday morning, so Friday, if I'd went out, he would know, and then if I did it Saturday, they would know because I wouldn't be at church, so that was the way that he kept me, kept me accountable. Um, but uh, moving forward, um, I started serving, and uh, after being there for six, seven months, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. You know, it was the Lord kind of, the Holy Spirit working in me saying, you need to do something, but, you know, I usually don't know what the Lord wants for me until I'm already there. Um, and so the way that it worked out was I said, you know, with my past and everything, I got I to gotta do something, and so I decided to sign up for the military. And so, so I sign up for the military, I go through, do the ASVAB, do all the stuff, do everything I need. I'm literally at the day to sign my papers. I already got the job picked, everything's good. Um, they had to sign a waiver because I have tattoos. And at this time, the government was kind of not wanting to hire as many troops, so they cut back. And so my glucose kept coming back inconclusive. It just kept coming back. And they did it like three or four times. And um, finally they said, we can't sign a waiver for this. You know, they're, they're just, it's the restricted thing. And we're just not doing that. We're not signing two waivers right now. And so you've already got one signed for this. And of course, I was completely devastated. But at the time, you know, that I had my life planned out, right? I had this vision of what I was going to do and how I was going to live my life. It was still going to be for God, but where I wanted to go and not where God wanted me to go. And so God shutting down that lane um, was him putting me on his trajectory where he wanted me to go. And uh, what ended up happening was, so I come back, keep working my job. I worked at the jail. Um, I worked it for four or five more months, and finally my pastor at the time, he graduated from Southern. He was with me serving and doing everything I'm doing. He was like, you probably, I think you need to go to school. So that's how I ended up going to Southern's undergrad, which was Boyce. Um, that's where I met my lovely wife, Jenna. She went there, too. Um, so after we were there, um, I was there probably a couple years, two, three, and then we got married. And... Um, and we, I worked for Sodexo, which facilitated Southern. I was a mechanic for, technically for Southern, but I worked for Sodexo. And uh, then her brother offered me a job to come back to, um, to this part of the area, working for J.A. King. If any of you guys know what J.A. King is, it's a calibration company, and they do all the scale measurements and all that stuff. But anyway, I took a job working with him. We ended up living in Providence, and I did that for about eight months. And the whole time I was just uneasy and every day I was listening to sermons and uh, wishing that I wasn't at work working on machines and wishing I was talking to people about Jesus. And uh, basically what happened was the Lord was working in me and I, I felt like I should be doing ministry full time. I mean, uh, you know, going to school and doing everything like why, why am I not doing this? And so I went to Jenna and, um, you know, it, it was, we, we had the discussion. I'm like, if I'm going to do full time ministry, it, then I need to pursue it like. You know, either we're at the point in our life where we need to buy a house and this is what we're going to do or I need to pursue full-time ministry. Um, so I ended up, you know, we just both decided that because uh, she's just as much a part of it as me that we were both going to pursue full-time ministry. And I put my application in um, from Alaska all the way down to Haiti, praying that it was somewhere warmer than colder. But uh, we ended up in Arkansas, which was is really, really warm, if you didn't know. But the allergies, you think Kentucky allergies are bad. Arkansas is horrible. So um, that was the only downside to Arkansas. Uh, we love our church now. Uh, we have wonderful people there. We have really good friendships and relationships there. But we moved when Jenna was seven months pregnant. And so we had always lived like in Louisville or off on our own. We had never really been really close except for the eight months when I took the job for a brother. Um, and so us living on our own was being away from family was normal. Like it didn't bother us, you know, we're two young kids in Louisville. We can do whatever we want when we want. We enjoyed ourselves being able to go eat and do whatever. And so, um, anyway, after Thea was born, and we had been there for, for a couple years, this would be our third year in Arkansas, uh, and wanting to have more kids, um, we just really, I really miss, I have so many fond memories of my grandparents and spending time with them, and I was with them all the time. And so, um, we just want to be, with having more kids and stuff, we just wanted to be back closer to home, and so that's kind of what sparked that idea. And so, uh, I was like, you know, Brad, send him, see if he knows anything, and that's kind of how that, that whole thing, not ever even fathoming that it would be this quick or I would be standing before you guys here right this moment. Um, but that's just kind of how, how all that, all that work and kind of my story. Um, I do want to share a quick story with you guys since Brad's message last week was on confession. 
So the church that I'm at right now, we, uh, Brother Bob is our lead pastor. He's 68. He's very traditional, cowboy boots, cowboy hat, suit and tie. Um, we only have a choir. Um, and so they do have instruments, but it's like, you know, traditional, traditional, usually only sing hymns. Um, but then, uh, so that's Brother Bob, and that kind of sets the groundwork for our, our, our church. But then I have J.D., which is our youth pastor, and he's like my best friend. I love him to death. Um, what he did to me, actually, the other day when he found out that it was April Fool's, and what he did was he put my phone number on the um, youth ministry Facebook page and told them all to message me crazy stuff, pretending like it was coming from you guys. Like, we can't wait to do mass with you on Sunday and, and, and all that. So I got messages all day long that were, like, really out there. And the first couple, I even texted Brad. The first one, I'm like, hey, do you have this number in your phone? He's like, no. And so right then I knew. I was like, it's either the office ladies or it's JD, and they're messing with me because it's April Fool's. But anyway, I ended up catching him because the last person that messaged me at the end of the day said, ha-ha, your buddy told me to do this off youth ministry. And so then I had to, to catch him because he denied it all day long that it was him. But anyway, so I'm just trying to set the character for JD. Uh, so we ended up going, um, our, our lead pastor, is, I'd only been there like a month, and he was like, hey guys, I have to go buy a new truck, why don't you guys ride with me? It was up in Missouri, it was like a four hour drive, why don't you guys ride with me so we can all get to know each other and just spend a little time together. It was just like a good day to just, you know, fellowship together and just hang out. So we get going up there, and we're driving all day, and we're all talking and all that, it's all going good. And um, we get to the place where Brother Bob's going to buy his new truck, so he buys it, and we're sitting outside on the tailgate of his old truck just waiting for him to do it. And J.D. looks over at me, and we're, we're sitting there talking about theology and real deep, so he's got me in this deep discussion, you know, and we're sitting here talking about stuff, and he looks over at me, and he gets real kind of quiet and serious. He goes, Seth, have you told Brother Bob you have tattoos? And I was like, I, I mean, that's, that's not something that registers in my mind, you know, in an interview or something, because there's so much a part of me. I don't, I don't even remember that I have them most of the time. And like I said, this church is really traditional. So anyway, um, I said, no, why does it matter? He said, I don't know, man. I don't know if he would have hired you if he'd have known you had all them tattoos. And I said, are you serious? And he was like, yeah. And so anyway, then Brother Bob comes back out, and I'm like sweating beads, sitting here thinking, like, I'm going to get fired as soon as he knows that I have all the. And we just moved from Kentucky and gave up our everything that we had and moved and all this stuff. So anyway, um, we drive for about an hour, and the whole time I'm in the car, you know, I'm praying and my heart's going like 100 miles an hour thinking, Lord, please just give me the right thing to say. Let him find favor with me. Just whatever, whatever I could think. And uh, we pull over and a barbecue joint and we get out and um, we, we're starting to eat. And I look over and I said, Brother Bob, I, I got to tell you something. And he's like, yes, yeah, son. And I, he's like, what do you got? And I said, I have tattoos. And he was like, and I have a lot of tattoos is why it's, why it's kind of funny. But he said, uh, he said, son, why on earth are you telling me that? And so J.D. just bust out laughing, you know, that, that he, this whole time he was messing with me. And I didn't know, J if I'd known J.D. like I know him now, I'd have known that he was, he was messing with me. But anyway, I, so my whole point was, I want you guys to know before you vote that I have tattoos. So I don't want that to be a secret. I, I, don't, want, I don't want you to find it out. Or, so but anyway, that's... that's all I <laughs> Great job, Dan. Let me ask you a couple of questions that I, I know some folks have asked. Uh, I know that safety and security is an important thing for us as a church when it comes to kids and for you. And so it's one of the areas where we felt in the interview process we connected. Would you just share a little bit about that? Yeah, so other than um, sharing Jesus with the kids, the security and safety is definitely the, the number one thing. With the way things are and the culture that we have, uh, I know that it sounds bad, but you, you can't trust anybody. You don't know who's going to walk through the door. And the thing about church is you want everybody to walk through the door. So we have to keep our kids safe. So that's checking in, checking out, name tags. Um, you guys already have a security team set up, which is really cool. Um, I'm really for the sexual abuse and abuse training, the things you go through before you start becoming a teacher. It's not, it, it just lets you... It, it gives you an idea of things to watch out for, of things that somebody that maybe is new and just joined the church and they want to serve in kids and seems really awesome. And you do a background check and the background check goes good, but then, you know, there's, there's things that maybe they haven't ever got caught before. So it's just different things like that. So safety and security for me is um, extremely important. I know you also have a passion for, you know, children's ministry has been something that many churches have uh, have kind of passed off to the ladies to be to be done. And I know you have a passion of involving men in kids' ministry. So would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So if you are a man here, I will probably be bugging you to serve. What I found in children's ministry is that 
the women are awesome. We have so many women that want to serve, and I, I love it. But what the issue is, we don't have a lot of dads that want to serve. Now, they'll want to, they'll want to be security or they want to teach uh, youth or something like that, but it's hard to get them to serve in the children's ministry. And especially when you guys run buses and things like that, kids with broken homes who don't have moms or dads, it's really important to me to see a husband and wife serve together at whatever age it may be, whether it's youth or teaching or whatever. So it's super important for me that dads are involved. Cool. And the one thing I didn't ask in the first gathering I meant to was uh, one of the things you, we ask you, how would you share the gospel with a child? Uh, and, and I know that our team really uh, appreciated your answer. Uh, so uh, as, you know, I, I'm one of the ones that, you know, a lot of times teachers or parents will bring their child to me and say, talk to her, you know, or talk to him. And, and we're trying to teach parents to be the one to talk to them, but we as pastors want to be helpful. So how would you share the gospel with a child? Yeah, so usually what I do is um, I start in the, the Garden of Eden. You know, we're, we're all sinners uh, because of Adam and Eve and what they did. And so I, I tell the kids that, um, you know, why, why did Adam and Eve sin? They say, because they ate of the, true, uh, the, free of the true, or <laughs> fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so um, I, tell, well, I explain to the kids that this isn't a magical fruit. This isn't that they just bit into this fruit and this fruit had some magical thing. I was like, God specifically commanded them not to do one thing, and they disobeyed God. And so that's what the sin was. So I tell them, you know, if God had put a boat in the middle of a pond out there and said, you can do anything you want, but don't get in the boat, then if they had done that, that that's what sin would have been. And since um, Adam and Eve sinned, we're all sinners. And so what God does is... Um, God when, God, when when God works on our hearts, He's drawing us to obedience where we're able to obey. And so, um, you know, when we confess and pray the prayer and all that, all that is out of obedience where God has worked in our hearts and is drawing us to Him. And so, um, Jesus dying on the cross for us um, forgives us of those sins, but, you know, the, the whole thing is He's drawing us to obedience where we're able to obey like it was before everything that happened in the garden. And so, everybody needs a a savior and so that's kind of that's kind of how I explain it to the kids I think I explain it to them that way because sin is really hard concept even for adults we know they're bad things but what's really hard is that you know if I sin against Tyson it's easy for me to feel bad because I did it against Tyson it's easy for me to know I did it but ultimately my sin is against God and so that's really hard for kids to register and that's why I kind of use the obedience thing because we're trying to obey Jesus and so it, it just kind of clicks. I found that it kind of clicks a little better. All right, man. Thank you. Could I ask our other tattooed staff member to come and pray for uh, my friend Seth and uh, then lead us in teaching today, man? Right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning, and uh, I thank you for Seth and Jenna, Lord, and, and uh, just the amazing possibilities. Uh, you know, whether it's here or wherever else they choose to serve, Lord, or wherever you put them, uh, that they would be successful, that their, that their family would uh, be healthy and be able to grow. And uh, um, I just ask this morning that uh, your will be done as, uh, as we as a, a body of believers uh, decide uh, to bring this family in, into our church and, and to lead our children's ministry, Lord, that... Uh, uh, you would just do it. Just uh, uh, let your will be done completely uh, through us. And I just ask that uh, you be with Seth and Jenna uh, as as uh, possible transitions come about. That uh, that they would all go smoothly. That that everything uh, would be uh, uh, easy and peaceful for them. In Jesus' name, Amen. Oh, thanks, Brad. See. I, I said the table was heavy during the first service, and he made fun of me, so he moved it for me this time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Didn't want you to strain yourself. I, yeah, appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, my name's Tyson Lindsay. I'm one of the leaders here. Uh, I get to speak from time to time, and I really appreciate the opportunity to do that. And uh, Brad is always really good uh, about giving me an opportunity to speak from time to time. And uh, uh, I kind of made a joke in the first service, uh, you know, uh, what do you want me to talk about? And, and it's just something, pick something from the Bible. Okay, well, my Bible's got about 2,000 pages in it, so that really narrows everything down for me. Uh, uh, so when we were discussing what to talk, uh, made a phone call to him this week. He's been camping all week, the poor guy. I'm sure he's just wore out. 
and, and just couldn't handle it this morning. Uh, but anyway, so we were talking about what to discuss. We've been discussing worship and uh, f- ways to do that, what that looks like in the local church, what that looks like for us as, as individuals. And uh, as, I, as we had this discussion ab- about ways of worship, uh, what we've already discussed and, and what should we still talk about, uh, one of the things that kept coming into my mind was uh, worshiping through learning. And uh, as, I, as I started to still consider that, you know, I have, I have a great opportunity to help teach at Graves County Middle School. And then, I, you know, I have the opportunity uh, to teach Sunday school here and, and preach from time to time. And uh, the thought of worshiping through learning uh, has just always really stuck out to me. Uh, I think over the past several years, the church as a whole uh, seems like they've done kind of a bad job of discipleship, in my own personal opinion, uh, meaning that uh, we don't focus on it a whole lot, uh, or the fact that we only focus on one part of God. And uh, I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Uh, and so as I, as I started trying to figure out how to, how to express this, this thought or this idea, uh, it, it kept coming back to me that, uh, you know, there's so much imagery in the Bible uh, and in our worship music uh, about this, the marriage relationship that we have with, with God that, uh, you know, the, and the Bible is clear. The church is the bride of Christ. Uh, there's beautiful imagery of this intimate relationship between the church that belongs to Jesus and Jesus himself. The, you know, heaven is described as a wedding feast and, and all these other things in this, this beautiful, intimate relationship. Uh, there's songs that talk about touching the face of God and, and uh, make it sound like this warm embrace. And, uh, and, and all of that's true. Like there's, there's nothing better than, you know, seeing Liz in the kitchen and just giving her a big hug. She hates it when I hug her in the kitchen. I don't know why, but just that, that warm, intimate relationship to, to hug and embrace and know everything about her. And she knows everything about me. And that's one of the pictures that we get of our relationship with Jesus. And while that's true, and that's absolutely something that we should focus on, I think we've done a bad job of focusing too much on that side of our relationship, and we have neglected the amazing awesomeness that is God, that is so far beyond imagination and understanding that we've allowed ourselves. uh to become soft and mushy. Uh, one of my undergrad professors at Midcontinent, his name was Dr. Todd Buck, and one of his favorite lines was uh, when he would refer to some of the modern worship music at that time, this has been almost 15 years ago, that uh, all of the music is just telling me that Jesus is my girlfriend, that it's that's all this soft, mushy, you know, kissy face, you know, meets heaven like a sloppy wet kiss and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, that we've forgotten how awesome God really is. Uh, and so as we try to worship through learning, trying to focus on who God really is, uh, in, in the book of Exodus chapter 20, uh, that's when God comes down on, the, uh, on uh, Mount Sinai and he's giving the Ten Commandments to Moses. Uh, there's a, a section there where God's voice speaks out like a trumpet and the people are so afraid that they fall down and say, please don't say anything else. Don't speak again because we can't handle it. Don't say anything else. Just in this amazing fear and trembling before the God who created them. And that's, that's something that I think is easy for us to forget um, because it's, it's nice and, and gentle and easy to think about this marriage relationship where everybody loves everybody and it's this easy, you know, sort of a carefree sounding situation, but we forget how awesome God really is and what he is really capable of. Uh, And so with that, uh, I want to take you to the book of Job. I've been really focused uh, personally on the Old Testament uh, the past few months, just because uh, the classes that I'm taking at Southern right now have been all about the Old Testament. And so they have forced me into uh, reading it, falling more in love with it. Uh, Over the past 
16 years or so as I've uh, grown as a minister, I have really neglected the Old Testament. Uh, I've, I haven't paid attention to it like I should, and there's so much of it that uh, I haven't read. Uh, and at times that makes me feel a little bit shameful because, you know, I, I feel like I make a good effort to be a good teacher, but uh, I've neglected portions of the Scripture. Uh, and so as Seth is making some confessions, I, I will too. You can kind of lead it on, brother. Uh, so in Job uh, chapter 38, uh, what we have is, is God having a conversation with a man uh, who has been through some pretty serious junk. Like he has lost everything. Uh, and when I say everything, I mean every kid is dead. All of his stuff is gone, burnt, took, stolen. Uh, even his health uh, has been taken from him. Uh, uh, and he's just sitting in a lump uh, and complaining a little bit to God. And so God uh, gets his attention, and they have this conversation. So Job chapter 38, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge, dressed for action like a man? I will question you, and you make it known to me. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting is, uh, as awesome and amazing as God is, he is also a God with a sense of humor. Uh, and even though this is a very serious situation, uh, I, I think, or I do anyway, because I'm kind of a sarcastic person. And so sometimes I read that in scripture a little bit, I think. Uh, so we have God speaking to Job, saying, get, get up, get dressed, quit being a lump on the ground. We're fixing to talk and you're going to tell me what I want to know. And, and so I can just, this image in my head of, of you know, a dad slapping his little boy across the head, get up, or let's do this, is kind of what I see in my head. He says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garments and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no further. And, your, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From, from the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked into the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light, and where is the place of darkness? that you may take it to its territory, and that you may discern the path to its home. You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. So tell me, Job, because you're an old guy. You must have been there when it was done. Uh, you're complaining and asking me, you know, about all the stuff I did wrong. So tell me, you know, let me know. I'll, I'll fix it. You tell me what I did wrong. So, uh, you know, how amazing is that? How big is God to say, you know, this is what I did. Don't, you know, I'm big enough to deal with whatever you're dealing with. I'm big enough to handle it. I'm big enough to handle your doubt, whatever that might be, whatever you may be doubting. And just some of the, I don't know if I want to call it tangible because it's still like way out of understanding. But uh, God is so big that uh, the, the science nerd in me, there's a few of my students in here that I get to see tomorrow in science class, so they'll be happy with this. Uh, you know, the, the tiniest subatomic particle, I get a little bit nerdy, you know, it's the Higgs boson is the smallest building block of matter that's been discovered so far. Like, amazingly, incredibly tiny. So small that just the act of observing it makes it go away. Is it's so, it's amazing. You should read about it. Particle physics is fantastic. All the way to the furthest observable star that we have, or that we can see, uh, 
it's with the naked eye, here it is, with the naked eye, we can see 16,308 light years away. So there's a star out there in the universe that you can see with your naked eye, and it took the light from that star 16,000 years to get to your head. Okay? With a telescope, we can see 13.3 billion light years. It's 13 billion years it took for the light from that star to get to the telescope. Now, we could have a, a huge discussion on the age of the universe and the age of the earth, and, and I would love to have that discussion with everybody that wants to have it, uh, but it would be too much for right now. Uh, so just imagine what it takes. We set our clocks by the way the stars rotate and how regular they are in the sky. All the way out to 13 billion light years and all the way down to the building blocks that make up every skin cell in your body that are all rotating around this universe in such perfect time that here you're sitting here. And God has orchestrated all of that from the beginning of whenever he started until this moment right here and every moment after. How huge and amazing is God? So much more than just the wedding side of our, you know, eternal intimate spouse that we get to spend eternal eternity with. How much more is he that we can learn about him, that he has put us in a position in the universe where we can observe all of the things he has created and understand them to a, a pretty high level. Uh, to, to be able to have the knowledge of how these things work and how amazing it is. And so when we worship through learning, it's not just about learning Scripture. It's about understanding the place God has put us in, uh, about uh, being in community with the people around us. Uh, when we have questions, not being, able afraid to, not being afraid to ask them. So that is, that is what we are worshiping. Uh, this amazing divine creator of everything seen and unseen. So now, how do we, how do we learn about that? How do we, how do we learn about God? Uh, so some more, some more Old Testament scripture. Uh, there's a, a verse in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Uh, if you grew up in a Jewish home, you would call it the Shema. Uh, and it's uh, something that they learn at a very early age. Uh, and they will often memorize it, and I would uh, encourage you to do the same. I'm, I'm working on it uh, myself. And it's Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So the way we learn about the God we've chosen to serve is by bathing ourselves in the scripture that he has given us. Uh, as Christians, I think a lot of times we neglect the Bible that we've been given. Uh, God has revealed himself to us through the scriptures. Uh, 66 books, uh, 39 in the old, 27 in the new. Uh, and, and it's put together the way he meant it to be. I fully believe that. Cover to cover, uh, your Bible is going to look a little different than mine. Mine might have different notes than yours and, and stuff like that. Uh, but this is infallible. It never lies. It won't lie to you. And every part agrees with every other part. I 100% believe that. And that is how we will learn about the God we serve and how amazing and mighty he is. All the way from the fearful trembling uh, of the Hebrew people on Mount Sinai, all the way uh, to the amazing wedding feast of the Lamb that we can read about in the book of Revelation. Everything in between is covered. But in order to learn about him, we have to allow ourselves to be in the scripture, to read them for ourselves, not just to come on Sunday mornings for a three-hour period. Uh, I'm just as guilty as anyone else uh, of that, of allowing my faith to be a three- or four-hour box on Sunday morning 
and then waiting six days to come back and do it again. Uh, we have to get away from that. We have to make it a habit of worshiping God every day uh, through the scripture, through learning. Uh, and I think if, if we are able to do that, if we're able to commit ourselves to that, that we will see an amazing change happen, uh, not only in our church, not only at Community Fellowship, but in our community at large in Mayfield, Graves County, Paducah. Uh, I, I think things would quickly begin to change. Uh, one of the practical ways uh, to do that, I'm going to advertise a little bit. One of the practical ways that we can do that here is we have four classes on Sunday mornings uh, that meet here in the building. Uh, besides that, I know that there are several people that uh, have small groups that will meet from time to time, uh, you know, once a week, every other week, things like that. Uh, and, and we have uh, some goals of having other short-term Bible study groups that will meet from time to time. Uh, but right now, on Sunday morning specifically, uh, at 8 o'clock, there's a Sunday school class that meets in the back room. Uh, and Dwayne Woods is the one that leads that. They're studying through the book of Mark right now. Uh, and that's the only one that meets before church starts. Uh, but at 9.15, uh, there's three classes that meet right now. One of them is uh, the Deaf Ministry Sunday School class. And uh, Lindsay Williams is the person that typically leads that. And they're going through a book called The Story, uh, which is uh, uh, just a, 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 a story of the life of Jesus. And, and they're working through that book. Uh, if you choose, if you want to go to that class, uh, it's important that you know American Sign Language uh, because that's what they use to communicate in that class. Uh, and so if you don't know it, uh, you'll most likely be lost. Uh, but uh, there's uh, two other classes that meet. Adam Mathis is the teacher uh, of a class right now. We're studying through the book of Colossians. Uh, and that class meets uh, at the back room, uh, the same as the 8 o'clock class. And then this morning, uh, Jamie Hughes uh, started teaching a class that meets upstairs at the first room, as you go through the doors upstairs. And they're also studying through the book of Mark, uh, but it's a video series that's hosted by Francis Chan, who's an amazing teacher and speaker. Um, and uh, so they're meeting at 9.15 this morning too. They met this morning, uh, and so that class will be continuing now forward. Uh, so those are your options to immediately engage in discipleship starting next week. Um, you know, if you normally only come to the 11 o'clock service, Say, so, you know, wake up a couple of hours earlier and, and try one of them. Uh, you know, there's, there's several to choose from. Pick one. If you don't like it, move to another one. Uh, there's, there's nothing that says that, you know, you're stuck, you know, once, once you get into a class. But I would encourage you to ask questions. Uh, as you go through the week, uh, pick a book of the Bible and start reading it. Uh, no one expects you to understand everything you read. Uh, you know, there are, are PhDs and, and all kinds of stuff that people that still don't know everything they read in the Bible. Uh, you know, and I think it's that way on purpose. I think God did that for a reason. Uh, because if all the answers were right there, easy to see, then people would be coming to us and we would have nothing to do. Because they would just walk in the door and everybody would believe and we would just eat donuts, I guess. Uh, you know, but, but please hear me. Uh, as you go through the week, make an effort... My challenge to you this week is pick a book of the Bible. If you don't already engage in some type of personal study, uh, whether it's a, a devotional book or whatever it may be, then I would encourage you to pick the book of Mark. There's already two Sunday school classes reading through it. Pick the book of Mark. Start reading it this afternoon or in the morning, uh, 10 minutes, and, and begin pushing yourself beyond just that initial belief of I'm a Christian, and growing yourself further in to really see uh, what this life can be like. So let's pray. We'll, we'll get ready to take up the offering and, and finish up. Dear Lord, I thank you uh, for today. I thank you for everything we've already done. I thank you uh, for uh, Seth and Jenna and, and wh what they mean, uh, what they could mean to us, Lord, and what they already mean to the places that they've already served. And uh, um, I thank you for being able to worship you through observing communion this morning, Lord, that uh, we can remember the sacrifice that you gave to us freely and willingly choosing to allow yourself to be murdered. Uh, on a horrible, horrible cross, Lord, that, uh, that you chose to allow that to happen uh, so that we could have a way 
uh, to get to heaven. And uh, I just ask that uh, as we as we begin to close this morning and, and we uh, get ready to take up the offering, Lord, that uh, that you would do exactly with it uh, what what you would have us do with it, Lord. Teach us exactly how to use it. Uh, and I just ask that you would multiply it, that uh, the same way that you did with the loaves and the fish, Lord, that, that you would take this offering and multiply it a thousandfold so that we can uh, continue the ministry that you've set before us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So if, uh, if the ushers would go ahead and, and come down, we'll, we'll take up the offering. And uh, I, I want to remind you, a couple weeks ago, uh, Brad talked about uh, worship through giving. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's a penny or a $1,000. Uh, Jesus uh, was very clear when, when uh, the elderly woman came and just basically dropped a penny in the box, uh, how amazing her gift was compared to the Pharisee that dropped in, you know, whatever it was, we'll say $1,000, uh, some great amount, and how showy he was and just dropped it in. Uh, how much more amazing and how much more attention did he give to the, to the old lady who felt that her gift was nothing, that she just dropped it in the box and expected nothing to come from it, but it was all she had. Uh, and that is the gift that meant more to Jesus than the $1,000 gift from the guy who probably could have given 10000 And so whatever your gift might be, know that it is being used uh, as wisely as we know how to use it as a church, and that it's being sent forth to do ministry uh, for Christ in our community and in our world uh, as we are, have the opportunity to do missions in other places as well. All right, go ahead, gentlemen.